All righty, all righty. Praise the Lord. I'll tell you, that's two great songs about how to fight the battles that we have to fight in our Christian life. We all know we have to fight battles, but God's given us the authority to win every battle. The only battles we lose as his children are the ones we don't show up for. And God has given us that authority to stand, and I'm going to sing my way out of the valleys. I'm going to sing my way up, on the mount, up to the mountain. You know, I'm going to raise a hallelujah, and the, my weapon is a melody. Raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Those are all realities of the Word of God that tell us that uh, God has blessed us to battle this enemy that we we face all the time in every situation of life and that we can be triumphant in this thing. I want to start and share a few messages. And um, when we get back to church, I have a series that I've called The Hurt Locker. And we just bar barely got started on it. It's, I think, a really good word for us. And I think a very uh, timely word for us. And we'll get back to that. And in the meantime, I've... Uh, I've been asking the Lord, well, what do we do in the meantime here? Because I know it's a little bit different because you guys are in your homes or uh, automobiles or wherever you might be. You're supposed to be staying at home. Uh, but anyway, wherever you might be, uh, you're looking, you're watching this. And uh, I don't know what kind of an environment you're in and all of this kind of stuff and how many are there. But the point being that it is different when you're watching online than it is when you're, um, you know, when you're, when you're here, when you're actually in the service and we can see you and so forth. And, 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 but anyway, so I, I've been praying about this and I was, uh, this past week, I've, I've been doing a lot of studying on King David. And I know for many people, King David is their favorite Bible character. And, uh, you know, you just about anything about King David you're interested in because he just seems to captivate the imagination and the attention of most people. And there's a really good reason for that, and that is for because almost anything that happens in life, good or bad, David seems to be the wonderful example of every bit of that. And so I was, I've been studying him, and I've had lots of time. And I've, I've started reading things that I had read, you know, all through my life and years ago. And, you know, you, you kind of, if you're not careful, you, you begin to read the Bible uh, looking for messages and, or, if you're a pastor. And you, you really don't read everything as if you're just somebody interested in what's being said there. And so I started doing that, and, and I've come with uh, several aspects of David's life. That made, that made him great. And, and so I, I guess if we had us a little series going, we could, be, we could call it Design for Greatness because that's what we are. We, as God's people, are designed by God to be great. And God has so commissioned our lives and, and, and formed us and birthed us. As a matter of fact, in Psalm, in Psalm 103, this is a, uh, excuse me, Psalm 139, this is just a tremendous word that David gives us about, the, about how we were created. I mean, just, just notice what it says, what David says here about, about God creating us and why and how and so forth. He just says, for you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. We've been, we've been, we've been, uh, God was like, he just weaved us in our mother's womb. Uh, we're not some accident of of creation or protoplasm or some whatever you want to call it. We, God wove us in our mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they all were written. What was written? The day's fashion for me when as yet there were none of them. So what is David saying here? David is saying to us, look, God knows all about us and God created us and God created us for a purpose and that purpose was to leave a mark in this world. Now we all know people that pass uh, through this world and pass, uh, and pass away and they, they never leave a mark of any kind. You know, they never helped anybody, they never led anybody to the Lord. They never carry, they didn't carry anybody to heaven with them. 
Um, they were just, their, their life basically was, was wasted. And, and, and God created us to leave that mark. And then some folks, of course, leave bad marks. So uh, they do bad things. People, they're hard to get along with. They hurt people. You have to, when they're gone, you have to go to, uh, go to recovery to get over it. So God, you know, God, God doesn't want us to leave bad marks. What God wants us to leave is a righteous mark. God, God says, look, I have a, I've created you with certain characteristics and qualities and, and abilities, and I put you in this world, and I knew when you needed to be born, and I knew where you needed to be born, and I knew to whom you needed to be born. And I put you on this earth, and I put you on this earth in order for you to leave a mark on this earth, a righteous mark on this earth. I created you for greatness, and you can be great, and everything about your life can be great. Now, the trouble with talking about greatness when you're talking about it to people who live in this crazy world we live in is that greatness, according to the way the world looks at things, usually involves lots of money, plenty of power, and loads of personality, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what we usually think of as being great in this world. But greatness with God is living the life that God has created for you to live. As a godly mother or a godly father, God has created you to rear children, to know him and to love him, to be responsible. You've lived a great life if that's what you've done. God's called you to work at a, an office. He's given you the personality that can get along with people. He's given you the mechanical skills to be able to handle office work of any kind. And he's put you there as a, as a witness of himself. And he says, now what I want you to do is I want you to witness for me. I want you to be a positive example. I want somebody to look at your faith and say, what's going on with you? I want you to make a mark in that office where you live. And if you do that, if you make a righteous mark for him, then you're living a great life. Some of you are designed to be school teachers. Others, bus drivers. Others work at uh, businesses. Some of you are designed to be presidents of college or leaders of corporation. But, but God's called all of us for something. And as long as we accomplish what God has, has put us here to do, and you can tell by the way he built you and the tools he built you with and the nature he built you with, what he has in mind. And as long as you do that, God says you are great in this life. You have accomplished what I have created you to accomplish in life. And I would like for us to look at David's life today and we're going to do this, well, for a few weeks or until we get to come back here together and just look at some of the characteristics of David and look at this thing about being great. We're, let's just use David as an example of what, what needs to be true about our life in order for us to, to be a great person. Well, the first thing that I obviously see in David's life is that from the very start of his life, David is a warrior. David, David fights lots of battles, you know. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest events in his life he's known for when he was a teenager is going out onto a battlefield and fighting a battle with a tremendous uh, giant from the Philistines and winning the battle. And then people begin to acknowledge the fact that, uh, that he was a great person. He was noticed really nationally for the first time. Of course, that wasn't the first battle that he fought. But in everybody's life who is great, there are going to be some battles that you have to fight. If you're going to be great, you're going to have to be God's warrior. And that means that there is going to be a battlefield in your life. So let me give you, I got a couple of truths about fighting on the battlefield. I'll have to give you one today and one next week. You know how that thing goes. Uh, I won't have time for all of it today. But, but here's, here's the first truth about being great and about being a warrior for God. Every good man or woman becomes great on the battlefield. Let me just put it up there so you can see it. Every great man or woman becomes great on the battlefield. You don't become great if you, if you don't go to the battlefield. Greatness is found on the battlefield. 
Now, when I talk about God's battlefield, I'm talking about in service to God. Wherever God has for you to serve, that is your battlefield. Doing what God has called you to do with your life, that's your battlefield. And that's where you become great. You become great engaged in those things that you know that God has called you to do. Now, for David, being great meant being a great king. And David was a great king as long as he was on the battlefield. David was a fine young man. You remember when Saul came, I mean, when Samuel, the prophet, came to the house and said, let me, uh, God has sent me to anoint the next king of Israel. And David was a fine young man out keeping his father's sheep, and, and, and he was honorable, and they had to call him in because they didn't even think about him. And he was anointed, and then his dad sent him right back out there into the, sh into the pasture to keep the sheep. And so he was a fine young man while he was keeping his father's sheep. But his greatness first becomes apparent when he stands up on the battlefield with Goliath and defeats Goliath on the battlefield. And David w went on to, on the battlefield and, and won victory after victory after victory after victory. He's considered Israel's greatest king. And as long as he was on the battlefield, he was victorious in his life and winning victory after victory. He became greater and greater and greater and greater in the eyes of the people and in the eyes of the Lord. And the people of Israel, because he was on the battlefield and he became great and he won many victories, they became more and more and more secure. The first battle, of course, that David fought was not against the big giant Goliath. The first battle that David fought was against uh, what he described as a lion and a bear. And you remember, if you've read anything about David, that as he kept his father's sheep, David said, uh, one day a lion came out and grabbed one of my, my sheep, and I ran after him, and I grabbed him with my hands, and I just tore him apart with my bare hands and, and got my sheep back which said that he felt the life of a sheep was worth the, worth the battle there. Then he said, and a bear came out and got one of my sheep, and I chased him down, and I tore him up. So if David had lost the first couple of battles of his life, he would have just been a tasty morsel for a lion and a bear. But the second battle of David's life was against a big giant named Goliath, and it was on a battlefield, and it was a winner-take-all battle. If you read the scripture very carefully, you'll see that in the battle that, that David fought with Goliath, the rules of the battle were whoever loses the other side becomes slaves to them. In other words, if David lost the battle to Goliath, then all of Israel would become slave to the Philistines. And if Goliath loses the battle, then all the Philistines become slaves to the Israelites. So here we have the showdown. We have the champion of the Philistines, Goliath of Gath, and we have uh, the teenage slingshotter from Israel, uh, <laughs> Jesse's boy, David. And, and, and David swung his sling, and, and you know the story, and defeated the giant. And, and, um, and, and this was the first of many victories that David won on the battlefield of life. And the more David fought as a warrior for God, the greater the victories he won and the more greatness he experienced, the more safety and peace and security Israel enjoyed. Of course, he becomes the king of Israel after some years. And here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we find an unusual thing for David. David declines to go to the battlefield. He's been battling for years. He's won victory after victory. He's a tremendous soldier for God. And yet here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, David declines to go to the battlefield and fight the battle. Look, look we're going to put it up here for you. Look at what it says. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him. Joab was his great general and all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, David remained at Jerusalem. So his, battle, his army is out fighting battles, and Joab, the general, is leading his army. But this was a time when kings went to war, and David should have been out leading his battle against the Ammonites and against all the enemies. But David wasn't out leading the battle. David was back at home at the palace 
in Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening. Everybody say, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. When you see a line that says, then it happened one evening, it's a "Uh uh-oh. Yeah, why did it happen? Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. You know, these homes in Israel had flat roofs, and so he walked out there, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh, this is not a good thing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. Sure he did. I told you David had a sex problem, didn't I? I have mentioned that. If you've been here in our church, (laughs) you know this is going to be a bad little deal right here. Because David did have a problem uh, with uh, sexual things. That was the way he medicated himself. He had lots of pain, and it was a medication for him. Anyway, so here we go with uh, Satan giving him just what he needs, you know. And David sent and inquired of the woman. Someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, David knows Uriah the Hittite because Uriah is one of, his, one of his soldiers, one of his favored soldiers, as a matter of fact. Very honorable man, very good man. And he's, he's with Joab in the army up at the front fighting. Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him. And he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Then David sent Joab to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Then Uriah, when Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing. So he's going to get a little small talk going here. You know how it is. How Joab, how's David doing, and how are the people doing, and how is the war going? You know, just all these little niceties and stuff. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Now, that is just David's way of saying, go down to your house and get involved with your wife. I need you to get involved with your wife because I want to cover up what I've done, and I don't want to be accused of anything. So I need for you to go in and make everybody think, well, her husband came home from the battlefield. It's no wonder she's with child. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. I suppose he had like a little butler from the palace following him with a tray of food for Uriah and Bathsheba. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all of the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. You know why Uriah didn't go to his house? He was an honorable man. Uriah didn't go down to his house because all of his, all of his fellow soldiers were on the battlefield fighting a battle, living in tents. Uriah said, it's not right for me to enjoy my home and my wife and all the pleasures of marriage and life back here at the palace and while all of my boys are down there struggling and dying on a battlefield. This is an honorable man. Uriah is an honorable person. And he slept at the door on the, on, the, on the porch of the palace right there by David. So when they told David saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said, Uriah, did you not come from a journey? I'm sure David couldn't understand why Uriah didn't do that. Because David's thinking, I sure would. Why didn't you go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, he's saying this to David. David, as you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. This is an honorable man. Then David said to Uriah, wait here today also and tomorrow and I'll let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next day. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the, with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. David tried to get him drunk 
Well, if he won't go sober, maybe if I can get him tight enough and loose enough, maybe he'll forget about all this morality stuff and go on down to the house. But he didn't. Uriah's an honorable man. So in the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab, the general, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. So when Uriah's headed back to the battle now in just a few minutes, he's got his own death warrant in his hands. He's carrying in his hands a letter with a seal on it of the king. And when he hands that letter to Joab, Joab's going to open that letter, and that letter is going to say, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. David was a great man, but obviously this is a very, this is one of the lowest points of David's life. This was a, this was a terrible thing to say the least about David. So David should have been out there leading his army in battle for the first time in his life. He did not go to war with them. This was the first time this had happened, and he's back here at the palace where he shouldn't have been. And this begins the most painful time in the life of David and his family. David had had an affair with a woman, had called her husband home from the battlefield, hoping that to have him go home and, 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 and cover the pregnancy and relieve him from accusation. But Uriah was an honorable man. He slept at David's door and he didn't enjoy his marriage. And David sent him back with a letter that told the general to put him on the front of the battle and take the soldiers back so that Uriah will be killed. He carried his own death warrant back with him. And so David killed this great honorable man just as sure as if he had stuck the knife in him himself. Interesting observation about being honorable. Take just a second, all right? In Matthew chapter 1, I just want you to see this. I told you that Uriah was an honorable man. So what did God do with the fact that he was an honorable man and died this terrible death? Well, he, he, gave, him a, he gave him a holler and in the New Testament. <laughs> yeah, in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew writes to say that Jesus is king of the Jews, so a king has to have a lineage. So Matthew goes back to Abraham and traces the lineage of Jesus through David, through King David, all the way up through to Jesus. Mark doesn't have a lineage because he shows that Jesus is a servant. Luke has a lineage because Jesus says, Luke says that Jesus is the perfect man, and a perfect man has to have a lineage. So there's a lineage in Luke, and there's a lineage in Matthew. John, he's heaven-born son, and God's son doesn't have a lineage. And so there you go. In Matthew chapter 1, look at what it says here when they're giving the lineage. It, this, they're on down now, late in it. But it says, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. By the way, that's Rahab the harlot, <laughs> by the way. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. There's Ruth the Moabitess woman. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. You see, in the New Testament, they wouldn't even put Bathsheba's name in the lineage of Jesus. When they put it in the lineage of Jesus, God says, here's what I want you to write. I want you to write that Solomon came from David and that woman who had been the wife of, of Uriah. Uriah was such an honorable man that in the, in the genealogy, when the genealogy of Jesus was listed, uh, God gave him a, an honorable mention in, in the lineage of Jesus. And David caused more harm to him and himself and his family than any enemy could ever have done. No enemy could beat him on the battlefield. No enemy could overtake him at home. On the battlefield, David was a champion for God. But in relational life, David was a reproach to Israel and caused more harm to Israel and to his family than any enemy could have ever done on the battlefield. Why, didn't, why, did, why did kings go out to fight in the spring? Well, you might remember that the, the, the economy of Israel was agricultural. For those of you that grew up on farms and maybe even ranches, especially if you grew up in open country and 
You didn't have fences and barriers and so forth. One of the things you might understand about this springtime of the year was that it was the springtime of the year when arguments over the boundaries of property would come up. The farmers had to go out and, and, and plow the lands and they had to sow the, the fields and they had to have their livestock in certain areas. And so uh, in wintertime, it didn't matter because there were no crops to, to get, there were no animals. But in the springtime now, you've got to plant a crop that's gonna preserve your family for the whole rest of the year. So it's important where your boundary is, that you plow on your land that you put your animals on your land and that you don't encroach on anybody else's land. So in the springtime, there were lots of disputes. And one of the purposes for any government is to make sure that their land is not encroached upon and that their people are not killed. And so it was the responsibility of the king to lead the army in battle to go out into the fields where the people were running into each other and having problems to make sure that they didn't lose any land or, uh, or lose their life. Now, thank God that, the, that they didn't have to do this all year long because once this, once this little rush in the spring was over, um, they, this lasted for probably a couple of months, but after a couple of months, then they could go back to the palace and, uh, and, and, and rest there for the rest of the year. I mean, God doesn't expect us to fight battles every day of the year, right? Yeah, thank God that he doesn't. Because, because God wants us to live a, a, an enjoyable life. What did Jesus say? I've come that you might have life and that you might have a bunch of it, that it might be an abundant life. So God doesn't intend for battles to last all year long. Sometimes God says, hey, when the battle is on, get in the battlefield and fight the battle because the enemy's trying to take things from you. But when you're not in the battlefield, go back, have fun, live a productive life, live a balanced life, have a happy life. But there are just certain times where you're going to have to show up on the battlefield because the devil wants to take everything that belongs to you. And he does. What does the enemy want out of your life? Well, he wants your mind. He wants your family. He wants your health. He wants your destiny. He wants your body. I mean, he wants everything you have. And if you don't fight him for it, he's going to take it from you. So God has given you authority in order to defeat the devil on the battlefield, but you don't have to stay on the battlefield when the battle is over. But when it's time to go to the battlefield, God calls you to the battlefield. And every time David went to the battlefield, he won the battle. Every time you go to the battlefield, you'll win the battle. Uh, like I said, to start with you, the only time you lose is when you don't show up. The best of you comes out when you're on the battlefield. The greatness of you comes out when you are fighting the devil and fighting for what's yours and committing yourself to walk in the destiny that God has called you to live in. When David showed up with his battle uh, with Goliath, with the sling, Goliath began cursing David by all of his gods. And David looked at Goliath and David said, you come to me with your sword and shields but I come to you in the name of the living God. And David defeated the enemy. And when David defeated the enemy, all of Israel, all the soldiers of Israel, uh, rejoiced and were rejuvenated and were full of courage and routed the enemy. The other soldiers, in other words, when David fought his battle on the battlefield, and won his battle because God had given him the, the authority over this uncircumcised Philistine, all of the other soldiers were encouraged by the victory that David had got. But when David stayed off of the battlefield, his wor the worse in David came out. And his country was demoralized and his family was defeated because David, David, David was called to the battlefield and wouldn't fight. On the battlefield, could we conclude about our lives that the best of us will come out and on the rooftop, 
the worst of us comes out. Why didn't David go to the battlefield? Just quickly, I know we had just a few minutes. Why didn't David go to the battlefield? This was a time when kings went to war. David had the authority. David won every battle he ever fought. Why, why didn't he go to the battlefield? Well, let me put a couple of suggestions up here on the board for you if I can get my, my equipment to work. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's what it does. <laughs> All right, number one. Maybe he felt like his success had earned him the right to retire. Maybe one of the reasons why David didn't go to the battlefield is because uh, David felt like that he had done enough and he had lived enough and he had accomplished enough and he had conquered enough and um, it was time for David to retire. I mean, that's the American dream, isn't it, right? <laughs> that we would somehow get ourselves in the position, we would get our money right and get our, uh, our life right and get everything in order so that we could retire. And there's nothing wrong with retiring from jobs. I, I plan to retire one day myself. I don't have any idea when that might actually be. I don't really see a, a retirement plan that God's listed for me in the Word. But, but I, I look forward some time to you know, being able to do different things and have a little bit easier life. But you know, you can't retire from life. And even though you can retire from a job, you can't retire from God's call on your life and what, God's, what, what you do for the Lord in life. That's right. You, you, lay, you lay down your scepter and somebody else picks it up, right? I mean, you, you lay down your scepter and somebody else uh, is going to rule your marriage, rule your family, rule your life. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't lay down life you can retire from work and have a better job and have an easier life and all of those things, but you can't retire from God. So maybe, maybe David didn't go to the battlefield because he just felt like that he didn't need to go to the battlefield because he had done enough and it was, he could retire in life. Don't ever feel like that. The, we're made great on the battlefield, <laughs> not made great in, in the fishing boats and all that, and it's fine. I'm not trying to get on to you, but I think you get the point. You can't retire from God. Here's the second reason why. This is really the one I think really happened right here. This is, this is what I think. Um, maybe he had already spotted Bathsheba and was just waiting for his opportunity. In other words, this was premeditated. What happened was premeditated. It wasn't like David was just out on the rooftop strolling around, looking at the countryside and taking in the scenery and, and saying, uh, yeah, well, oh, what is this? That's a nice little home. Oh, who is on the roof? Uh, no, no, David was a lust hound. And, and David, I'm sure David had spotted her many times before. Now, you have to remember, in the winter time, the women didn't come on their rooftops. And, and, all, rooftop, and all women didn't come on the rooftop. But she, but she would just happen to come on the rooftop, which... I'm not so sure that she didn't do that because she knew David was watching. This was her audience, and I'm just speculating. But the point being that in the wintertime, they don't come out on the roof to bathe because it's too cold. So now that spring is coming, David in his mind is thinking, well, spring will be here before long, and I'm sure that when the weather warms that Bathsheba is going to come back out on that house and... I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to, let the, I'm going to let my boys go and fight the battle, and I'm going to stay at the house and get on the Internet. Yeah, he knew she was going to be there, and he walked over, and he was looking. Her husband was gone out to the battle. He calls for her. There's not much resistance. She comes right away. Uh, I don't know how much you could resist the king. I'm not really trying to blame Bathsheba. But... She comes up, and, and, and then, of course, obviously, uh, thing, they, things take their course. And, and what no soldier could do to David, uh, Bathsheba does, uh, and the two of them do, and cause more pain than any enemy ever could, could to the life of David. The, promise, the problem with the enemy that we have is that he promises pleasure, but he only delivers death. Um, he... he he promises us, promises us to give us great enjoyment, but he only brings 
pain in life. I mean, if the devil can't kill David with a bullet, maybe he can kill him with a Bathsheba. Uh, a, a poison pill in a, in a pretty package. Uh, anyway, David, David, this is, the, this is the sad part about all this. It didn't have to be. Because this is really the sick part of all this. David had many wives. The Bible lists eight of them. And there were many more than eight. And he had many concubines just waiting in any way to be of service to David. So it wasn't like David's needs weren't being fulfilled. And yet he reaches out and Uriah has only one wife. And he takes this one wife from this faithful, honorable man who was fighting in his own army, protecting the kingdom. Low point, low point in David's life. David's only in his mid-40s when this happens. Just let me tell you this. David's going to recover from this. This is not going to be the end of David's life. David lives to be about 70 or 75. This happens when David's about 40, in his mid-40s or so. He comes back and he does some great things, but of course, you know, obviously, some things are going to have to happen before that happens. One of the things that make David a great leader is that David was not only a great sinner, David was a great repenter. And God's not through with David yet. If David had been on the battlefield, he wouldn't have been back at the palace. Greatness is determined on the battlefield, not on the rooftop. On the battlefield, you'll win every battle. God gives you the authority God says, I'm there to protect you. Raise a hallelujah. <laughs> My weapon is a melody. Raise a hallelujah. God will come and fight for me. I'm going to praise my way out of the valleys. I'm going to shout my way up on the mountains. God gives us authority in the spirit realm to win every battle on the battlefield, not on the rooftop. The rooftop is darkness, and darkness is the devil's domain. And though God loves you, he's not going to protect you on the rooftop. That's your decision and your choice. You leave the battlefield and go to the rooftop, you're on your own, so to speak. God will wait for you. There will have to be some things that happen. But God says, you want, to, you want to be a great champion? You want to be great in the kingdom? You got to be a warrior. And David is a perfect example of a warrior who lost his footing and went through some terrible difficulties. We'll look next week at this second truth about being great on the battlefield. I think you'll, you'll enjoy this. 